By way of introduction to our guests this morning, I want to share just a few verses from Romans 15. This is Romans 15, 5 through 7. Paul writes to the church there, a church he doesn't know, and he says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. We all have been welcomed into the family of God by Jesus' uh, purchase of us, and we are to welcome each other. This is what Paul is telling to the church there in Rome, a church he doesn't know, a church he hopes to work with in the future. And these thoughts were on my mind this week as I was thinking about this service and the opportunity that I have to share with you what has been shared with me and the other pastors. Uh, a number of months ago, uh, the leadership team from Ray of Hope International Mechanicsburg walked in the door. Uh, I got to, to meet with them, get to know them, hear their story, and I wanted you to hear their story as well. And so what I want to do now is invite um, our, our, our friends up here, uh, so I want to invite Pastor Robin Gurung to come up, and I want to invite Kamal Rizal to come up as well. Introduce you to these two individuals that I've gotten to know a little bit. So this is Pastor Robin. He's the pastor of Ray of Hope International Mechanicsburg. Yep, do you want to say anything or just say hello? Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Uh, I'm Robin Gurung. Uh, I'm the pastor of Ray of Hope Church in Mechanicsburg, and I'm very glad to be here in front of you all. And I just want to thank our God, Jesus Christ, for giving us this opportunity to be with you all. And I have been praying for this church and Pastor Todd and uh, his all leadership. And uh, we have been meeting, uh, we met, uh, we met uh, maybe three or four months before. And after that, we have been praying for this. What happened? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're okay. 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 <laughs> so uh, I have been praying for uh, Pastor Todd and his leadership and this church. And we are so glad uh, this morning to be with you all. And thank you so much for welcoming us as a one family uh, in Christ, and we are so glad to be here, and thank you. And I'm with my wife, and right, so my wife, can you stand up? Uh, she's right there, and she's my wife, and I have one son, even, uh, uh, his name is Jayon. <laughs> and thank you so much. Thank you, Robin. So, so, so Robin, Robin is their pastor. Uh, this gentleman over here, uh, uh, Kamal Rizal, he um, is what the, the resident historian, I guess, of, of what God has done. Sure, yeah. yeah, and he's gonna he's gonna share their story with us over the next few minutes. And so, Kamal, we're gonna turn it over to you and let you share. Cool. Okay. Sounds good. Yep. You want to take this? I'm not sure that that's not here for another reason. So we'll there. Well, good morning, everyone. I am super excited to be here today, and uh, I do have a slight confession to make before I begin. So I was talking to Pastor Todd, and he told me I have three hours. <laughs> so if I go on for three hours, please don't blame me. <laughs> I'm just following the orders. Thank you so much. What a honor, what a joy to be part of this fellowship here today. Our God is so faithful, and his mercies are made new every day. And I'm super excited to be here to testify his faithfulness in our people's life and in my life. And over the next few minutes, I'm gonna take the time to address and to share how God has been faithful and how God has led us from the refugee camp in Nepal 
all the way to become your neighbors. So I'm super excited to be here. Thank you, Pastor Todd. Thank you, church. Thank you, everyone who have opened their arms so widely to receive us. And we're so blessed to be here. Before I begin, I think it would be appropriate for me to share my story a little bit to offer a little bit of a background so you understand where I come from, so you're not confused why I'm up here and not Pastor Robin. So I usually introduce myself as Kamal from Nepal. <laughs> yes, you can laugh. When I first came to the United States in 2009, at end of 2009, um, I got connected with an American church in Idaho, and we went to a youth camp in McCall, Idaho. It's just a beautiful place there. And the pastor had me come up and share my testimony there. My very first time speaking in English, per se, a very rough, not knowing what I was trying to say, but I was just there just to testify what God was doing. So I just went on to say, I am Kamal from Nepal, not realizing that it rhymed. The next thing I noticed was people were laughing. And I thought they were laughing at me. And I was embarrassed. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. They were laughing at me. I was talking and they were laughing. But then come to find out, they were laughing because it rhymed. And I, I, and I, and I said to myself, you know what? I think I'm going to use that for the rest of my life. <laughs> I think that's a good way to go about it. So ever since, ever since, even in college, Every time I would, I would have to share something, I would always say, I'm Kamal and I'm from Nepal. In fact, my last name is Rizal, so I'm Kamal Rizal from Nepal. It is meant to be. So excited to be here today. I came to the United States in 2009. We came to Idaho with my family, and I got to live in Idaho for the next eight years. And I got connected with the church family there, and I attended River Valley Church in Boise, Idaho, where I got connected with the church leadership, and I got to participate in the, uh, the service, and I ended up even helping out with the youth as I progressed um, in, in the ministry there. And so I have known God and his faithfulness firsthand. I was born and raised in a refugee camp in Nepal. I will show you the slides here shortly, but let me just give you a hint and a little bit of a background before I begin the actual slides here. So I was born and raised in a refugee camp in Nepal. I came to the US in 2009, and I got to go to this American church where I was raised practically by them. They actually um, raised me up as a young man um, in faith, and they taught me what it means to be a Christian, a faithful Christian, and I'm so grateful for them. Over the next years, um, I went to high school there. I came as a teenager. I went to high school there. I, I completed the high school. But before I completed the high school, my mom passed. And a year later, my family decided to move to Iowa, not Idaho. Idaho is where we were from, or where we came to. And Iowa is where they went. And at that time, I decided to stay back because I was the only believer in my family who was a Christian. And so because of the lack or even uh, because of the different belief we had, it was difficult for me to become a faithful Christian in the family. And a time came where, uh, when the family decided to move to Iowa, and I said, no, I'm going to stay back because I have a church family here, and I'm, I'm growing in my faith, and I think I need to be here. I was still a teenager then. Uh, so, uh, so an American family actually welcomed me in, into their family, and I got to live with them for the next several years. Open graduation, I went to Boise State. Go Broncos, anybody? Uh, yes, Broncos. Went to uh, Boise State. I did my undergraduate there, graduated in 2017, and went on to do my master's in uh, accounting, and I graduated with that in 2018. Um, the whole time, however, I was away from the Nepali church. I was away from the Nepali culture. I was introduced to a new culture, which was the American culture, and I became accustomed to the way of life there. I loved God. I wanted to pursue God. 
And every time I would pray and I would seek the will of God, God would always call me and show me that actually I think I belong to the Nepali congregation. I think I'm, 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 I'm being called to fellowship and minister among the Nepali people. And so open graduation in 2018, I decided to move to Iowa. That's where my family was and I got to connect with the, the Nepali church there, uh, one of the Ray of Hope churches there as well. And I got to connect with them and I truly enjoyed being there. I saw the faithfulness of God even in their lives. Yes, they didn't know how to uh, play instruments. They didn't have proper pastoral training. They didn't have proper ministerial training. But what was there was the presence of God. And it was so powerful, I, got, I, I felt right at home. And so after attending that church for a year, I sensed that I needed to do more. And I could not just become a lay person. I actually wanted to pursue theological education. At the time, I was working for a CPA firm. Anybody here an accountant? Hey. <laughs> Hello, friend. <laughs> so I was working at a regional CPA firm in, I um, in Iowa, and the salary was great. I was enjoying the perks, amazing. But what I felt deeply inside was, I'm not called to become an accountant or I was not called to serve in that capacity, nothing against accountant or, accountant, um, or the field of accountancy. But I felt deeply called to minister and to do that in a, in a theological, in a, in a ministerial setting. Um, and so I quit my accounting career and I moved to Southern California. And so I got to attend Biola University, that's where I got started. I got to meet one of the retired professor there and I got to live with him and he actually, um, he uh, took me in as his grandson and so we got to enjoy fellowship there for the several years I was there. And so COVID hit and I was working on uh, some stuff, theological stuff. I started making YouTube videos explaining the, the biblical narrative. I started from Genesis. The idea is to go through all the way to Revelations to help people in, the, uh, at least the Nepali-speaking uh, people, to understand the theological narrative of the Bible. And so that's still undergoing. But as I was working on that, COVID hit, um, and I was confused as to what I would be doing next. Um, but I had a unique opportunity. I received a call from a pastor who actually started the whole ministry, Pastor Sonam, which I will talk to you about here shortly. Um, and he talked about uh, opening or starting a missions agency. Uh, we call it Ray of Hope Mission Agency, which helps pastors and leaders and evangelists in India and Nepal and even here to share the gospel and make the name of the Lord known all across the world. And so he called me and said, hey, I think we could really use you. And you have an uh, accounting background. I think you can really help us out. And I think that would be a unique opportunity for you to uh, move to Harrisburg. And you can help us with that. And so I readily accepted the offer because I always wanted to connect and work with the Nepali people. And so I moved to Harrisburg in 2021. And um, that's how I got connected with Ray of Hope Church deeply. Although, if you were to take back all the way in the, in the camp, I was actually born and I accepted Christ uh, in one of the Ray of Hope churches. So I'm going to share you this story here shortly. So that's how I came to Harrisburg. And that's how I got to connect with you uh, two years later. So I'm incredibly blessed, so excited to be here. So I'm going to give you the history of how uh, we came to be, our cultural background, how Ray of Hope churches started. Uh, what, we're, what are we doing here and what are we planning on doing and how we can work together in, 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 this, in this. So I'm ready for the slide whenever. All right, as I said, I gave you a brief, uh, brief history about myself, background a little bit, but I will tell you a brief history about our culture as a whole because I'm actually here to represent my people, not just me, so I'll do that here shortly. Uh, and next we'll talk about the life in the refugee camp, what the situation was like when we were there, how long we were there, and what was the condition like when we were uh, living in the camp. And third and finally, we'll talk about how our lives are going on here, how the church is working, and what are we doing to, uh, to establish the kingdom of God 
not just in this community, but across the world. So uh, ready whenever, next. All right, anybody know where Nepal is? What is that, like 2% of you? <laughs> so Nepal is a tiny, tiny country sandwiched between the two Asian giants, India and Nepal. I mean, India and China. Sound familiar? China and India? Must be, right? So you see on the map right there, um, right there, the tiny thing, that's Nepal. The bottom is India, and up there is China. Uh, you can go next. So as you can see, Nepal, it's a tiny country. Underneath that, that's India. But for the sake of this map, I wanted to show you where Bhutan is also. I think I should probably speak into that. Yes, um, I think that's important. <laughs> OK, so I think I'm just going to look at there. Um, so our background, when, we, when you guys have probably heard of us, you have heard of us as Bhutanese refugees. And, but I introduce as Kamal from Nepal. How does that make sense, right? What's going on there? That doesn't make sense because Bhutan is a different country, Nepal is a different country. There is a history behind it and I'm gonna tell you that right now. All right, so let me just take you back all the way to late 1800s when one of the kings of Bhutan took several thousand people from Nepal to Bhutan. It was a legal process. A lot of people were taken to Bhutan to work in Bhutan, to help with the development. The lower belt of Bhutan, which I will tell you here shortly, was still uninhabited. There was no people living in that region, the southern belt. And what the king did was took several thousand people and they put them in the southern belt of Bhutan. This was back in the 1800s. There, there is a history that says like people actually started migrating to Bhutan all the way in the 16, uh, 1600s. But le uh, not legally, but like the officially, the, 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 the king of Bhutan actually facilitated the migration in the late 1800s. And the purpose, as you can see on the screen, was to develop uh, and to work on their infrastructure and for the economic development of the, the Bhutan, or, or the nation of Bhutan. Next. Um, and so as I said, they started to settle on the southern belt, and that's why the people who migrated from Nepal to Bhutan were called Lo Sampas. I don't expect you to uh, remember that. That's basically to say the people of the south. So they were called Lo Sampas, or doers. Um, and so they contributed to the cultural diversity. Bhutan remained primarily a Buddhist nation. And people who were taken to uh, Bhutan more so were Hindus, but there were also other ethnic backgrounds like uh, Buddhists and other, other uh, religious backgrounds as well. And so people actually lived in Bhutan for uh, several years uh, next. And they participated in the culture. They shared with, uh, with the culture there. They, they got to practice the tra uh, tradition. They got to practice their, uh, their, their culture. And they still felt at home. Uh, they were able to speak in Nepali. They were able to practice their uh, what, whatever different religious backgrounds they, they belonged to. And so they, they actually were working up the ranks. Um, as they were there, the Nepali people actually began to flourish. In, in, in Bhutan, and they were actually participating not just on the, the lower level, but they were actually able to participate in the upper governmental positions as well later on. But the time came, um, uh, attention or discrimination began to arose. I don't want to give you all the dates because uh, that's going to confuse you, but like basically after several years, almost 100, 100 years later, the, the, the Bhutan or the government of Bhutan felt something was different. So these Nepali people were growing in numbers rapidly. And Bhutan being a tiny nation, less than a million people at the time, uh, these Nepali people were uh, almost up to like 25 or even 35 percent of the whole nation, uh, the nation's uh, uh, total population. And so these people were 
were speaking in Nepali, uh, practicing their own, uh, own traditions, and so they felt threatened somehow. And so the, the government enacted a policy called One Nation, One People. So that's basically to say, if you were to live in Bhutan, you cannot speak in Nepali, you cannot wear your Nepali uh, clothing, and you cannot practice your tradition. You have to do as we do, that is to speak in Jonka, that's the, the, the language there, and you have to wear their national clothing, which is a little bit different than the Nepali one. And all the officials and all the, the work that needed to be done had to have done or have to have been done in Jonka, their, their language. And they stopped uh, teaching Nepali at their school. They burned literatures and they burned uh, anything that uh, reminded people of the Nepali origin. And so that's when the tension began to arose. Um, so what happened was, obviously, as the people, as the Nepali people were growing large in numbers, uh, they began to feel uneasy, and they felt uh, threatened by the government. And they began to speak up. But uh, Bhutan being a monarchy, meaning the, rule of the king has all the, all the say, uh, the king basically said, uh, you can't live here anymore. Mind you, the Nepali people had been living in Bhutan for several years, and they were actually active participants in the economy and the overall development of the nation. They were actually citizens of Bhutan legally. They had all the paperwork, they had land, they had family, they had, like, my parents and my grandparents were born in Bhutan. Uh, just a fun fact, in Bhutan, they got married when they were very little. My mom was nine when she got married, can you believe that? My dad was 13. <laughs> Impossible, right? I'm sure maybe people in the back, they might have been married young too, so just be nice to them. They've been married for a long time. <laughs> but what I mean to say, different culture, different timing, away from all the e economic development of the West, away from everything else, they had their own way of life. But they were enjoying their lives, they had their own simple life. They were, uh, they were farmers living in Bhutan, simple-minded people, a lot of times people didn't get to go to school. The schools would be like two hours walking distance and um, that was not feasible because they would have to tend to their uh, kettles and, uh, and do farming and other things like that. So a lot of times, uh, uh, even, even the refugee people who have settled here, majority of them are not well educated. So they are very simple people, uh, not even high school sometimes. Uh, very basic. My parents never got to go to school, and so I was incredibly blessed when I when I came to the U.S., where I got to to uh, to actually learn from the finest educational system in the world. So I was uh, incredibly blessed by that. So what happened was like the ki king basically said, "Okay, enough is enough. Um, uh, you guys have to go." And so uh, so that's when it happened. 1990s, uh, people were expelled from Bhutan in hundreds and thousands. In fact, more than 100,000 uh, 100, people were expelled from this tiny uh, Bhutanese nation. Um, some say like 25% of, the, of the, the, the whole entire nation was evicted and kicked out um, because, uh, because of this uh, ethnic cleansing. Um, so as a result of that, um, people started migrating to uh, Nepal. It was a forceful migration, mind you. It was not a willful migration. If you didn't live, uh, leave Bhutan, uh, your, uh, your, usually your uh, uh, girls or even the ladies in the family would be raped or, or would be traumatized. The, the young people in the family would be taken to jail. They would be uh, severely uh, tortured and stuff like that. So it was not a forceful, it was not a willful uh, eviction. It was actually a very forceful one. People did not want to leave Bhutan because Bhutan is a, a nice hilly region. They were born there. Their families were established there. They had their, fa their, they had their houses and lands and everything was well established. And all of a sudden they come up, they wake up to this horror that they had to leave their country now. And so Bhutan, what they did was they put people in truckloads and they, they just uh, started shipping them to India. That's the, that's the border that they shared. That's the na next nation. But what, what India did was like, okay, we're not having you here either. 
So you can go back to Nepal where you come from, basically. And so what the, uh, the Indian government did was like they took the, the people and they uh, pushed them farther away into Nepal. And that's where the, the Nepali camps were established. As you can see, as you can see on the map, uh, Bhutan, uh, you can see the arrow, and then the, the tiny little uh, triangles you see, those were the seven camps, seven refugee camps that were uh, established as a result of these evictions. And so people were, more than 100,000 people were evicted and were living in, 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 in those camps. I was born and raised in one of the camps, uh, Timai, and I was born a year later. So I was born in 1993. I just dated myself. <laughs> Don't mind me, guys. All right, I'm, I'm still, I think I'm young, right? Okay, oh, I think I'm good. Okay, I'm not married yet, so I think that's fine. So, um, so Timai is where I was born. Um, there were other camps like that as well, seven different camps, and um, um, people started living in this hut. I will explain to you now. So let's look at the basic living conditions of, of the camp. As you can see, those little things, uh, they are houses, um, and those were the huts that we were to live in. And uh, they were extremely crowded, so we, had a, we, were, um, we were put in a river bank, uh, Timai River, and uh, we were about 14,000 people living in this little camp. I got to uh, visit Timai just a year, uh, not just a year, actually earlier this year, and I was surprised how small it was. I was blown away. I thought when I was living there, I thought the camp was massive. And I got to go and I was like, it was tiny. And I was like, how did we even survive in this? And that's what I mean to say. God has been faithful. And he was so faithful in taking us and in providing uh, for us, even in the camp. Um, so as you can see, the camp was extremely crowded. And the, the houses were not so nice. I'll uh, tell you now in the, in the slides uh, next. So the, the houses were made from uh, bamboos and plastic. And so it did not protect um, us from the elements at all. So especially in the rainy season, like when the rain would come, uh, basically the rain would just uh, come right through. And so there were many nights where we would have to like uh, hold on to our roofs um, to make sure that it wouldn't get blown away. And so in that condition, we lived uh, in, that, in that condition for several years. Even I was there for 16 years. I was born and raised. So that's all I knew. The only thing I thought I would uh, make up to when I, when I was growing up was like maybe I would become a uh, basic teacher um, and I would probably just own a bicycle. Mind you, not a motorcycle. I, I was, that was the only hope I had. Maybe I would have a bicycle. That was the, the highest I could even think. And, and, and then the hope was almost non-existent in the camp. And so we would have to share this uh, water tap. So not just my family, but several other families uh, in the camp would have to share one water tap. And they would release water uh, every like uh, once a day, no, twice a day for maybe a two hours period. And so we would have to go to this communal water tap and we'd have to fetch the water uh, from this uh, communal water tap. And um, I got to actually attend one of these schools here. Um, it was crowded, uh, one teacher, and we had like maybe like 50 or 60 students. And uh, even the teachers uh, didn't have proper training. So our education system was not that robust at all. But I was still thankful uh, for that opportunity. At least I got to go to school. My parents never got to go to school. And so at least I got to learn even from Chuck and uh, the, the Blackboard and different things like that there. Um, and so in the camp, we were not allowed to work. Um, that sounds kind of harsh, but Nepal, if you study that, there is a high unemployment rate. And um, for the refugees living in those camps, we were not allowed to go outside the, the camps to work. Uh, we were actually supposed to stay in the camp, and um, when there is no jobs, obviously um, there is nothing better to do. And so at, at times they had uh, one of those things, I don't even know what, what you call it, but people would engage themselves in some sort of threading, and they would uh, um, put together sweaters and stuff like that. Uh, and they wouldn't make any money at all. It was just bare minimum. 
but um, the, the job opportunities almost uh, was non-existent. Um, and it was in this time, Pastor Sonam enters the camp. And this is extremely significant looking back because it was Pastor Sonam who brought the gospel to us. Remember, in the, in the scripture it says, blessed are the feet of those who bring the good news. And it was Pastor Sonam who actually brought the gospel to, to the hearts and, and to, to our lives. So Pastor Sonam actually came um, to Timai in at the end of 2006. Um, and um, the church that I got to go got, uh, started in 2007, early 2007. And so when Pastor Sonam came, what were we doing? As you can only imagine, where there was no jobs, no proper guidance, no hope, no direction at all. We were, we were um, tied up in drugs and alcohol, uh, engaged in different mindless behaviors, and we had no hope. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know what it was meant to be loved. We had never idea what it, we, we didn't know what it was like to be hugged even. And it was part of cultural also, like in the Nepali tradition, we don't normally hug each other. But nobody ever communicated, hey, we love you. Uh, we care for you. You belong here. It was never like that. We were actually rejected, not just from Bhutan. We were rejected from even the locals that surrounded our camps. We were not invited into their gatherings. We were supposed to stay in the camps. And you can only imagine what the rejection feels like when you have no place to go, when you don't hear the word of love coming from anybody. The only, the only thing that comes out is hurt, as you have probably heard, hurting people hurt others. And that's all we knew how to do. We were hurt, and we also hurted each other. We knew, we knew nothing better. And it was in this time Pastor Sonam enters the camp. Pastor Sonam is actually from Sikkim, India. It's the northern part of India. And it's not that far away from the camp, but at the time it felt like it was so far away uh, because there was no uh, real mode of transportation um, and it was expensive and all that kind of stuff. That's why it felt sort of far. But Pastor Sonam enters the camp and he comes as a missionary. And what he does is he shares the gospel with people for the first time. It's not like that the, there were no churches in the camp before. It was just that the gospel was not communicated to us well. The gospel, the message of the gospel was presented to us as if we were the sinners and the church was, did not belong to us. Somehow we were the wretched people and the church did not belong to us. I don't blame those churches because they didn't have the proper understanding of the scriptures and they, didn't, they were not so welcoming to us. But what Pastor Sonam did was so different. He knew that we were hurt. He knew that we were com completely rejected by people around us. So he did not appeal to the sinful nature. We knew we were sinners. We knew we were already hurting and we were, we were up to no good. What he did was he communicated the love of God to us in a way that we could understand, in the language that we could understand. And he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will, will not perish but have everlasting life. And God loves us so unconditionally that he gave his only begotten son and that we can participate in the loving community of God himself. And he said, "For God knows the number of hair that he has on your head. He knows you by your name. You're not forgotten. Those were the messages that he came to camp with. And we're so grateful that Pastor Sonam came. It was because of this man's heart for people for my people, that actually opened a great door for the gospel to flourish in the camp. As a result of this, what happened? Several hundred people came to know Christ for the first time. And they were eagerly, they were eagerly waiting for the move of God. And what happened? As you know, hundred turned into thousands of people that actually came to know Jesus Christ for the first time. The rejection went away as the love covered, and, and the love became so eminent and so, uh, uh, so heavy, we could not feel rejected. What we felt was the very presence of God, and we felt 
we belonged and God loves us and that God is for us and not against us. And those were the messages that he came to camp with. And that's why people who were lost were into addiction, into drugs, into alcohol, all that kind of stuff went away because love was introduced to us. We needed love. It was not rejection. It was the love of God. It was not human love. It was agape love. Love that does not depend on our action is the love of God himself. That was communicated through Pastor Sonam, and we accepted Jesus in the refugee camp. And it was not just me, uh, Pastor Robin, Pastor Razman, and everyone that you see here most probably have been touched personally through, uh, it was the teaching of Pastor Sonam that happened. Um, so Pastor Sonam came and he led us spiritually. Uh, he talked to us about God and wh uh, what the nature of God was like. And as a result, thousands of people came to know Jesus.